Great, so thank you for joining. Um, today we are going to discuss ventilation and perfusion. So again, quite basic a topic, but very important. So if I can get the presentation started, why is it not? Is it this? Ah, perfect. So we're going to talk about ventilation and perfusion. The two go hand in hand. Uh, you want to see if there is a defect on the one or the other. And um, yeah, I think you guys are well aware of the very usefulness of this. Um, so it's also to detect uh, pulmonary embolisms, monitor response to therapy, detect or exclude chronic pulmonary emboli, and also do pre-surgical quantification of lung function. I think this is one of the more like acute things in nuclear medicine that you have to do so often you will get a request you have to do it uh, the same day or as soon as possible and this is a really an emergency procedure sometimes very nice that we have this service in nuclear medicine where we can offer real a uh, real diagnosis and um, information that is very clinically useful so there is a few contraindications um, if there is a significantly compromised vascular bed, the problem is that you will develop more, uh, or it can be more dangerous to have these small emboli and it might lead to bigger problems. If the person is maybe hypersensitive to the pharmaceutical that is injected, it does contain albumin. So I don't know how often we get this. I've not seen it before. And then also, of course, in pediatrics, this is not really performed because pulmonary embolism is rarely present in children. Breastfeeding and pregnancy is not contraindications. So um, you will have to maybe stop breastfeeding for 12 hours or so, but otherwise there's no problems. Um, for your non-pregnant patients or patients in their second and third trimester you can do ventilation first followed by perfusion just as the normal protocol but if you have a patient in the first trimester of pregnancy to be safe and to reduce the radiation dose you can do perfusion image first and then um, only ventilation if the perfusion is abnormal and down um, in that table below i just put out the different dosages when you um, do perfusion first. So you can see that you can actually um, reduce the radiation a, a bit. Yeah, it's it's significant. I think if we talk about um, fetuses and so on, this is really important. Every little bit counts. So yeah, perfusion first and then the next day the ventilation. Um, there is your doses that you get to the fetus. So it's really within the um, the guidelines of what your fetus should not be exposed to. It's really safe and important. The study is also always, of course, risks versus benefits. And as we know, the risks are great if the, the mother is not diagnosed effectively. So during SARS, COVID-19, we have to just remember this bad time sometimes, and I think this is one of the cases where it's still appropriate to discuss COVID-19. So there was a lot of research being done during that um, time about perfusion-only SPECT CT, and um, if the CT co-registration um, can kind of replace the ventilation part. And it was really sensitive. It had a great negative predictive value, but the problem came in with the false positive rate, which was 20%. And in the group of patients that we are um, actually doing, the perf uh, that we are performing these scans, you don't want to unnecessarily treat the patients for a disease that they don't have. So the specificity is really important. So at this point, it seems that the jury is out that uh, perfusion only spec CT is not the way to go and that ventilation is there to stay. Um, I also saw quite hesitancy in the clinics to to adopt a perfusion only spec CT even during COVID. So it was really not a decision of choice. Uh, it was made for us. So yeah, but it's interesting to know that there was really a lot of research done on co-registration. I, I think um, what is nice is that it was maybe a question that nobody ever 
asked and then it was investigated properly and then we did get like the outcomes that the specificity is a bit problematic so it was a scientifically um let's say that perfusion and ventilation is now validated scientifically as the method of choice So um, there is different ways to do ventilation. You get the insoluble gases, the metabolically active gases, aerosols, and then technigas. Um, yeah, there's the different options. And of course, it sounds nice on paper, but they were not all available to us in the clinic for sure. So at this point, the ideal qualities of a ventilation um, should be, agents should be, um, a short half-life, the imaging properties should be uh, close to ideal. Um, as you know, the SPECT camera systems or the um, gamma cameras were all developed for technetium 99M. So the 140 keV is ideal. So you ideally want a radionuclide that's imaged at 140 keV or as close as possible. So anything lower gives you a low yield um, of imaging. Anything higher, you have to put in higher collimators and the imaging becomes compromised. So 140 keV for single photon emission tomography is always the ideal energy um, window that you want to look at. So again, half-life should be short because um, you want to do more than one study on a day. And you also want to reduce the risk of contamination. So imagine you have a ventilation agent that has a half-life of a radionuclear physical half-life of 10 days. Then the patient walks around and um, also the gas that you produce it's a risk because it's a radioactive gas with a long half-life, so that's really important. The physiological properties is really important, so you want it to behave like oxygen or the air that we breathe in. So it should be, of course, safe as well as behave like gas. Um, that's really important. And then um, you have to look at safety and the radiation dose to the patient, of course. Also, since we have this unique population of patients that we image that are pregnant, Administration should be easy. You don't want to struggle in the clinic. And again, aerosols and particles should behave as closely as possible to gas. Righty. So there is different radionuclides that were used or is used for ventilation. They all have their pros and cons. Um, xenon gases or noble gases, they um, are relatively physiologically inactive. So it's really just a gas that you inhale, but the half-lives are problematic as well as the decay for imaging is not nowhere near ideal. And then also, of course, um, even xenon-133 where it was used a bit more as the beta minus um, radiation, which is also really increasing the radiation dose to the patient. You know, um, beta minus is actually cytotoxic and has a higher linear, linear energy transfer rate. So it's more like something like your uh, therapeutic isotopes, although this beta minus is not really that high. So it's still useful for ventilation, but this is really not ideal. So the decay of xenon-133 as well as the half-life makes it less than ideal. It's produced um, during fission in the nuclear reactor and it's given as a gas. Then you get xenon-127, which has a lot better um, decay properties for imaging. You can see that there is 172 keV and then um, also the others that is a bit on the higher range and then the half-life is problematic as you can imagine you don't want a radioactive gas with a 36.3 days half-life um, to be used in the clinic. Always when you evaluate the radionuclides imagine you sitting in the clinic you are the um, technologist and you have to administer this to the patient. It's uh, made in a high energy cyclotron and, and provided as a gas. Krypton 81M is said by many to be the ideal ventilation agent, but the half-life is um, problematic from a production standpoint. 
So 13 seconds is very short. So this is really nice if you want to do imaging um, because you ventilate the patient and you image and they are already not active by the time they go out of the clinic. It's um, really ideal also for um, radiation safety and all of that. It has a really good decay for imaging. Um, not really good, but it's it's really one of the more optimal ones, closer to the 140 keV than the others, um, and a really good yield as well. And it's produced from a generator, so you have a little um, dispensing system that has the parent isotope rubidium. Did I spell that cor correctly? I don't think so. It should have an E. Rubidium 81 metastable is um, the parent isotope loaded on this um, generator system. You ventilate the generator with air and it comes out as a gas and your patient inhale and gets imaged. Since the window is quite different from technetium, you can do dual imaging of the two at the same time. So you can have your ventilation and perfusion in the patient. And then, um, yeah, it's really problematic to get. You have to replace the generator every day and it has to be shipped and that becomes expensive. So Krypton 81M is, is interesting, but it's possibly not that feasible in the clinic or at least, um, yeah, the every day-to-day -day clinic. The next one um, is Technetium 99M based methods. So of course we can't make a gas of Technetium 99M and don't fool yourself, Technigas is not a gas. It is nanoparticles that are so light that they can be um, mobilized to, to float around in air, but it's still not a gas. And then you can also use the aerosol-based systems. The half-life of technetium is, is not the worst. Six hours, of course, is not optimal for this application, but it's not bad. Um, it makes the double imaging or the, the use of the Ventilation and perfusion on the same day sometimes a bit tricky, but yeah, it's not not bad. And then um, lastly on the list is just an option for positron emission tomography because it was missing on the list before. Um, half life of 68 minutes is is really great, and it's the same system as the Technica, so you also get nanoparticles, or you can maybe use an aerosol. Although I've not seen a publication with an aerosol. Um, but yeah, it's it's the same as technetium 99M. Uh, sorry, I already said all of this. <laughs> but just to recap, advantages and disadvantages. So the Xenon 133 was really available, just cheap. But as we said, it has this like bad irradiation characteristics as well as um, the... Um, half-life that is not ideal. So, yeah, let's just go on back. Can we go back? Yes, but it um, has some breakthrough also in the technetium imaging window, a short shelf life. So even though the half life is a bit longer, it's not so um, easy to transport and all of those. And uh, yeah, I think we've covered everything. Xenon 127 better for imaging, low radiation dose. You do require the thick collimators for those higher um, energies. And then um, you also get, uh, it's also cyclotron produced, which makes it quite expensive. Krypton 81M, short physical half-life, no co contamination problems. You can do immediate technetium imaging after, but it's quite expensive and you have to have fast delivery of your generator system. So just to show you how the CryptoScan generator work, you get like a little uh, air bottle and a little system in which you put your generator and then um, your parent isotope rubidium 81M is on this membrane and you vent it with gas and then your patient inhales. It has to be replaced daily, but it's available. So who knows, maybe one of you guys will use it in the future. Nebulizers. Um, okay, so now we go into the technetium side of things. So you get specially made nebulizers or ultrasonic devices to um, make small droplets of 0 0.5 to 3 micrometers in size. So it's quite small. It's not ideal because ideally you want to go into the nanoparticle range, 
but the smart wind is useful and this is the system so you can aerosolize with technetium dtpa i've seen people use other radio pharmaceuticals as well um, it should just be a radio pharmaceutical that is persistent in the lungs and does not dissipate so some other options might be a less uh, optimal and then it's important to note that the larger droplets of course will um, already deposit earlier on in the um, lung or, or the yeah the air system maybe in the um, throat or like the larger uh, lung areas and not go right there at the end where you want it so it's possibly not the most optimal but i think it's very useful and it has been used extensively and it does the trick great so technigas is then the more optimal one and as you can see the uh, scale of these nanoparticles is really small. Here is one that shows 16 nanometers. So these little carbon particles is formed. So it's really important to note that it's not gas. It is actually nanoparticles. So they have a surface material. Um, that crucible that you put into the system is um, able to produce these carbon nanoparticles. So your carbon combines with your technetium or your patechnitate, it's heated up to 630 to 850 degrees and then finally to 850 to 1000 degrees Celsius and then it makes carbon nanoparticle gas called technigas. It goes still up the temperature and then it cools. So it's really important to know that you have to you have your purge process, then you have your summer process, you pre-burn, you burn, and then you deliver it to the patient. Please keep in mind if you have a too long waiting period of these particles, so if you um, manufacture them but you take too long to give them to the patient, they will combine to make larger particles and grow. So the, the, they will not be nanometer in size anymore, and then you will get a less optimal imaging procedure. So it's really important to follow the steps as given by the uh, manufacturer and not let the um, preparation stand too long on the shelf. Okay, great. Then, um, since I mentioned PET, you can do the same system. There is a nice um, article for you for Galligas and the production of gallium um, MAA or gallium pulmosis, um, supposedly to give you better imaging resolution because of PET. Of course, you know, the resolution is better. Um, we've had many discussions about this in the clinic and I get the overall feeling from the nuclear medicine physicians that it's not worth the uh, amount of infrastructure that's uh, given to this or the um, price of the scans and also the use of the PET scanner. Um, really important to note, and, and this will be for many um, radio pharmaceuticals in the future that is applied, is that if we better imaging technology and we better the resolution of the scans, we should also adapt our criteria of, of um, diagnosis. So at this point, the diagnostic criteria when you do these um, procedures are really for the technician-based uh, spec CT scanning or the technician-based um, VQs that you do normally. And there is certain criteria of the size of the lesions and also certain smaller defects that you might not be able to visualize. But as such, the criteria is correlated with the clinical outcomes. And you know, at a certain level, it, it has a natural threshold based on um, the sensitivity of the method. So if you up the sensitivity of the method and the resolution of the method, you might be over-diagnosing patients according to current criteria that is out there. So it's all of these things that we need to consider in the future. I don't know if we will live in a society where PET scanners are as available as planner scanners now or you know, everybody will be doing PET for everything in the future, but then we will have to, of course, change the way we diagnose our patients. So that's just one thing to take into consideration. As such, I think technician-based VQ scans are still 
really efficient and appropriate and cost effective and it's maybe the most ideal way to do these scans and there is no need to run to pit although the images are really beautiful so please check them out so um then we move over to the other part of the scan the perfusion part so um i'm going to discuss perfusion with technetium maa um, the particles are less than 10 micrometers and they are trapped in the lung at first passage and cause temporary microembolisms. As we discussed in certain patient populations, they might be more sensitive for these emboli and have um, side effects. So always take into account the patient's um, overall health condition when you perform these studies. <clears throat> so we um, assume that the number um, of emboli caused is directly proportionate to the local blood flow. So the amount of blood flow takes a certain amount of particles to the lungs and you should have a rapid accumulation in one to two minutes of more than 89% of the particles. The biological half-life is two to three hours, so that's why you can image a little bit later. And normally we inject 100 to 400,000 particles um, sometimes I see 600 particles. It depends also, I guess, on the resolution of your own scanner, but you should never exceed one and a half million particles for safety reasons. Now, one and a half million particles is half of the amount of particles that should be in your pulmose as well. So you should also check the amount of particles that your um, facility the, the kit that your facility use, how much particles is in there so that you know that you should never do less than two patients per vial or inject more than half of the vial in the patient, for example, in pulmosis. So it's really important, the safety, because this can you don't want to cause lung embolisms in your patients, for sure. That's really the opposite of what you want to achieve. So we make certain assumptions when we do a lung perfusion scan. So we assume that all the particles are well mixed with the blood and that no clumping um, has taken place and that the distribution is therefore proportional to the blood supply. We assume that these particles will behave similarly to red blood cells and that they have no effect on the circulation so that we assume that we are just taking a snapshot of blood flow. We also assume that it's practically complete extraction in the lungs. So all the particles get stuck in the lungs and we also assume it's not metabolized too rapidly. So that we can do imaging. And I think all of these assumptions are, are really well-educated assumptions. So since this is radio pharmacy, I have to show you how to label this. Um, really easy to label. You take your um, particulate eluate, you add no more than 3.7 gigabecquerel in um, the volume of 2 to 10 milliliters. You should not use a breather needle to release air out of the vial, but after you introduce your protecnitate, say it's like 2 milliliter, you have to remove 2 milliliter of air. If it's 5 milliliter, you have to remove 5 milliliter of air. It's not air per se, it's nitrogen, so it's all to keep the... Um, Radio pharmaceutical stable, so it's not stable. Um, it's a it's that thing about the tin and all of that, and the amount of tin you need, and how the particles are made, and how stable it will be. So it really can have an influence on your scan in the end. You have to shake it for two minutes very well, just shake it, and then um, you stand, let it stand for fifteen minutes at room temperature. Sometimes the instructions on the different kits is a little bit different, so um, just always check your manufacturing instructions, and then you um, can draw up the requested patient dose. Shake before you draw up the dose, and then also um, swirl the syringe before you inject it into the patient, because all of this ensures that the particles do not aggregate, clump together, make big blobs, because those are really visible on your images. Quality control, you can do ITLC because colloids will stay at the bottom in acetone and your free protectinate will go to the front. So you can do an ITLC um, SG uh, based acetone study 
But then it's also important to know that this is not the pharmacopoeia method. The pharmacopoeia method actually says you have to push a small sample of the radiopharmaceutical through a membrane and then measure the membrane to see how many of the particles stayed behind and then measure the vial to see how much free protection that is there. So this is the pharmacopoeia method. The tricky part is um, to inject, to calculate the injection volume. So as we know, isetylmosis has approximately 3 million particles per vial. So you first have to determine the volume of labeling that you need. So you say, I want to inject 600 milliliter, um, 600,000 particles, and I want to inject only one milliliter in the patient. Then um, you have to calculate the volume of um, labeling. You have to calculate the, I'm sorry, I just muted somebody. <laughs> you have to calculate the um, amount of um, volume of particulate that you have to add. So I want to inject one milliliter with 600,000 particles into my patient. I have to add five milliliter of volume for the three million particles. So I have to decide how much radioactivity I want to add. So in this case, I want to do a, 700, a 70 megabecquerel. So I have to take 370 megabecquerel particulate eluted out of the generator, make it up to five milliliters of volume with saline and then add it to my vial. If I want to do 120 megabecquerel dosage, I have to add 550 megabecquerel in the 5 milliliter of volume so that I inject 3 million particles per vial. So this is a really important calculation that you have to do in the clinic. And you have to take also into account the decay correction. So of course, if you are going to inject a patient in two hours, you have to adjust the amount of radioactivity to compensate for that. So it's really important that you know how to calculate this. Common problems with technetium MAA is um, if there is smaller particle size, then it will not get trapped in the lung beds. This is something you cannot really um, figure out in the pharmacy. This is more like the on, on the manufacturer. So if you get a lot of liver uptake, um, if you even look for that, it's um, something to consider and also report back to the manufacturer. Clumping of particles, you will see these hot spots in the lung. I have seen it once in my life in the clinic, but this picture comes from this reference that you can also have a look at. Um, if the biological half-life is lower, there must be some issues with the particle size or the patient might metabolize them a bit quicker. Um, and then, of course, we have the excessive number of particles that can cause toxicity. So it's it's quite a procedure that you have to focus that you do the right stuff. There is also the use of um, human albumin particles. And then we have, so we have MAA and HAM. There is differences in how they are cleared from the lungs, the size and how they look. Um, these um, HAM Particles are nicer um, in uh, morphology. Like you can see, the MAA looks under the microscope a bit scruffy, but I think MAA is used most often where I worked. Um, it's same outcomes, not really a difference, but you should know that the clearance from the lung is different and the size is also, of course, different. And also the method of production, which I didn't include in here. Um, Okay, so the conclusion is that um, VQ scans are diagnostically definitive for pulmonary imaging procedures. Technigas is currently the ventilation agent of choice. Technetium MAA or HAM is the agent of choice for perfusion. And the place for PET VQ is not yet established, although it's really cool. <laughs> so um, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, let me just turn off this recording and then I will quickly give you some other arrangements.